All right, so welcome back. This is going to be our first and only video for chapter 19. And what we're going to do in 19 is we are going to focus on viruses. Now, when you look at a virus, it's really important for us to make sure everyone understands that viruses are not considered cells. And a lot of times people have the misconception that they are actually very, very super tiny cells, and that's not the case. Um, they're not cells, and they are not considered to be living organisms. Now, there's a couple of reasons why they're not considered to be living organisms, and one of those is they do not have the ability to reproduce on their own. So as we continue with the video, you're going to notice in order for a virus to reproduce, it's going to need a host cell. So because it does not have that ability to reproduce on its own, it doesn't have one of those characteristics of life that's necessary to be considered alive. The second characteristic that it's missing is that it cannot carry out metabolism, which simply means it can't eat. And so it can't do either one of these things on its own, and because of that, um, we do not put it into the category of living things. Now, when you look at a virus, they, as I had said, they are very, very small, what we consider infectious particles. And a lot of times, they're actually smaller than a ribosome. So a ribosome is around 20 to 30 nanometers in diameter, so that's pretty small. Um, but there are some viruses that actually do get to several hundred nanometers in length. Now, down towards the bottom of the screen, these are just some examples of different types of viruses. So the first thing to notice about viruses is they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. So over here, we have a tobacco mosaic virus, which is uh, basically around 250 nanometers in length and about 18 nanometers in diameter. This particular virus, which is an adenovirus, is between 70 and 90 nanometers in diameter. This is a flu virus, and so this one's between 80 and 200. And over here, this is one that we've actually already looked at. It's called a bacteriophage, a T4 virus. And this one is going to be about 225 nanometers in length and about 80 nanometers in diameter. And this one also has one of the most unique shapes when you look at viruses as a group. Now, when you look at a virus, the structure of a virus is actually relatively simple. And so when you look at the genome or the genetic material of a virus, it's either going to have DNA or it's going to have RNA. So what we do is we classify them as DNA viruses or RNA viruses. Now, the outside coat of a virus is going to be called a capsid, and it's going to be constructed by using various proteins. And so this is going to be the part of the virus that will enclose the genome or the genetic material. Now, the capsids are going to be built, as I had said, from protein subunits, and we call those proteins capsomeres. Now, sometimes you'll have viruses that will have a membranous envelope, um, especially if you have viruses that infect animals. Now, when you look at um, these membranous envelopes, they're going to be constructed of a special protein called a glycoprotein. Now, these glycoproteins that are being used to construct these envelopes are either going to come from the host cell membrane or they could actually come from the nuclear membrane within the host, and then that particular membrane is going to be replaced by an envelope that's going to be made by the Golgi apparatus within that cell. So down here towards the bottom, again, it's just a diagram to sort of illustrate the structure of a virus, and so we have several different varieties of viruses. And so if you notice, this is going to be the um, genome or the genetic material, and so in this case it's going to be RNA. This is going to be considered the um, capsid of the virus, and as we had said, those capsids are going to be um, created by proteins, and these proteins are called capsomeres. Now, over here, this one actually has a membranous envelope to actually enclose the capsid. Now, this is an RNA virus, so that um, genetic material is going to be found still within that capsid, but it sort of has an additional layer on the outside. And remember, that additional layer is going to be made of glycoproteins. And over here, you can see the bacteriophage. Again, the same idea. We're going to have that capsid on the outside. And in this case, this is going to be a DNA bacteriophage. And so that genetic material is on the inside. So when you talk about virus reproduction, as I had said earlier in the video, they can only reproduce if they are inside of a host cell. Now, this is going to illustrate just the very basic idea of viral reproduction. So viruses are considered obligate intracellular um, particles. And what that means is they will reproduce within the host cell. So they're parasites, basically. Now, because there's such a huge number of different types of viruses out there, um, they actually have a very limited number of host cells that they can actually infect. And so if you notice down here, these are going to be the steps that a virus will take to actually reproduce. So this diagram on the right, this very large circle that you see here is going to be the host cell, and this is going to be the virus that we're working with. So the very first step is going to be basically the entry 
of that virus. In other words, the entry and the uncoding of the virus. So this virus itself is going to attach most likely to the um, outside of that host cell. And then what's going to happen is it's going to inject its DNA or RNA genetic material inside of the host. Now the second step is going to be the replication of that particular um, DNA or RNA. Now sometimes that DNA and RNA will actually be incorporated within the DNA of the host cell. So if you notice, step three is going to represent the transcription and the manufacture of those capsid proteins that are being used um, to be able to build that capsid or that protein code of the virus. Now all of this is under the direction of the cell. In other words, the DNA that was injected into the cell is sort of directing the cell to build these various parts so we can actually build the virus within the cell itself. So if you notice down here for step four, this is going to be considered the self-assembly of those new virus particles. So all of the different parts that are necessary to create that new virus, the capsid proteins, the genetic material, all of that is going to be put together inside of the host. And now depending on the type of virus, sometimes the actual host cell will literally explode um, and release the viral particles. And then sometimes actually the um, host cell doesn't die. What it does is it releases those virus particles periodically um, through the lifetime of the cell. So as I had said in the previous screen, that was the basic reproductive cycle when it comes down to viruses. But one of the most heavily studied viruses is one called a phage. Now phages actually have two reproductive mechanisms. And the first reproductive mechanism is called the lytic cycle. Now the lytic cycle is when um, you have a phage that goes into a reproductive cycle, but that cycle culminates or ends with the death of the host cell. And we had mentioned that in the previous screen. So over here on the right, you're going to notice some of the same um, steps that we had mentioned in the previous slide. The first step is going to be the attachment. So this is going to be your phage virus. They typically infect bacteria. And so this phage is going to attach to the bacteria. It's going to inject its DNA or RNA material into the bacteria itself. That particular um, DNA or RNA is, is going to be incorporated into the bacteria DNA. And then, of course, under the direction of the cell now, with that new DNA or RNA, what it's going to do is it's going to direct the cell to synthesize or make new viral genomes and, of course, the different proteins that are necessary to create that protein code. And all of those different parts are going to be put together. Now, since this is considered a lytic cycle, the cell is going to explode and release the new viral particles into the environment. So if you notice it says a phage that reproduces only using the lytic cycle is going to be considered a virulent phage. Now virulent is um, basically a word that's going to be used to indicate bad. And it's bad because it's going to destroy the host cell. Now bacteria actually do have defenses against phages and what they use is they use something called restriction enzymes. And what these enzymes can do is they can recognize and actually cut up certain phage DNA and possibly eliminate the production of those new viruses and again protect itself from that particular phage. Now the second type of cycle that we would look at when it comes down to these phages is one called a lysogenic cycle. Now for these particular um, um, phages or viruses, what they're going to do is they're going to replicate the phage genome but they're not going to destroy their host. And so if you look down here towards the bottom, this kind of incorporates both the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. So over here it says the, the viral DNA molecule is going to be still incorporated into the host cell's chromosomes. This integrated viral DNA is going to be known as a prophage. Now every time the host cell divides, what it's going to do is it's going to copy the phage DNA and actually pass it on to the daughter cells that are being produced during cell division. So down here towards the bottom again, if you look at the diagram, you need to pay attention to your arrows. Because if you notice, this is going to be the point where the phage actually attaches to the bacteria and it's going to inject its DNA. So if it injects that DNA into this bacteria, it's going to incorporate um, that DNA into the host cell's DNA. So it's going to go one of two directions. It's either going to go this way to the lysogenic cycle or it's going to go this way to the lytic cycle. As we had said in the previous screen, if it goes to the lytic cycle, then that particular cell is going to be destroyed. If it transitions to the lysogenic cycle, then that particular DNA is going to be incorporated within the bacterial DNA and it's going to be passed on to the daughter cells. And so it's really important for you to understand that sometimes we have um, phages, viruses, 
that can actually reproduce in a couple of different ways and the outcome on the cell can definitely be different. It's either going to destroy the cell or the cell is going to be able to maintain itself and continue to reproduce, but it's still going to reproduce and make those new viral particles, but it's not going to cause the death of the cell. So oftentimes we talk about DNA viruses, but actually the broadest variety of viruses that are out there are considered RNA viruses. And so these are the ones that are actually found in viruses that infect animals. So sometimes they're called retroviruses. And what these retroviruses are going to do is they're going to use something called reverse transcriptase. They're going to copy their RNA genome into the DNA of the host cell. So HIV is the most well-known retrovirus, and this is going to be the one that actually causes AIDS. So the viral DNA that is integrated into the host genome, as we had said, is going to be called that provirus, and it's going to remain basically a permanent resident of that host cell. Now the host's RNA polymerase is going to transcribe, again, because it's integrated, the proviral DNA into RNA molecules. And so the RNA molecules are going to function both as messenger RNA for the synthesis of viral proteins and as genomes for the new viral particles that are going to be released from the cell. So if you look over here to the right, this is going to be the example of HIV infecting a host cell. Now if you notice, it's going to do the same thing as previous viruses. It's going to attach to the cell membrane of the host cell. It's going to inject its genetic material, so in this case it's going to be RNA. And if you notice, it's going to use reverse transcriptase, as we had said before, to sort of create a hybrid RNA-DNA uh, molecule. Now, the DNA itself is going to replicate and actually be incorporated within the nucleus of that cell. And when it does that, it actually creates that provirus that we had mentioned over here on the left. And remember, that's going to become a permanent part of this host cell's DNA. And so as this host cell's DNA is actually decoded, in other words, we create messenger RNAs to make proteins for the cell, it's going to make not only proteins for the cell, but proteins to help create the future HIV viruses and also the RNA genome for those new viral particles. And then like we had seen before, if it's considered a lysogenic cycle, which is what this is, it's not going to destroy the host cell. It's simply going to release those viral particles into the environment. So now what they can do is they can actually go and infect new cells. So viral diseases in animals can have various effects. And in this case, most viruses that do infect animals are either going to damage or kill the cells by causing the release of hydrolytic enzymes or they could actually harm the cells by producing various toxins within that cell. Now we do have defenses against viruses. There are some viruses where we've actually created things called vaccines or we have some drugs that are called antiviral drugs. And what they do is they tend to either prevent or to treat, if the virus has already infected the individual, certain viral illnesses. So what a vaccine is, is it's simply a harmless derivative or piece of that pathogenic microbe. So in this case, a harmless um, piece of that virus. So what it does is it actually stimulates the immune system to mount a defense against the actual pathogen if they are exposed. Now we do have viruses out there that are considered emerging viruses. And those are the ones that appear suddenly or suddenly come to the attention of scientists. Now these types of viruses can cause an outbreak that's called an epidemic. And this is going to be when the virus actually is going to expand its host range and possibly even jump to a different species. Now, the result of this is going to be a lack of immunity to that brand new virus that has been created. Now, if we have an infection that has reached the global level, then it's going to be considered a pandemic. So it's not as isolated as it was previously. So what we're going to do next is we're going to finish up this video by talking about viroids, and prions, all right? And these are considered the simplest infectious agent. So a viroid is a um, particle that contains a circular RNA molecule, and it's going to infect plants, and it's going to basically disrupt their growth. So you primarily find these in plants. Now, if you're talking about something called a prion, these are slow-acting, virtually indestructible infectious proteins that are going to cause brain diseases in some mammals. Um, prions are going to be propagated by actually converting or folding normal proteins in that individual into the prion version. And then they're going to aggregate or simply come together. And that's what's going to cause the disease 
um, in these mammals. So a good example of a prion infection is going to be mad cow disease. Now down here towards the bottom, this just gives you an idea of how these um, prions are going to be propagated. As we had said, these are going to be the normal proteins in that individual. This is the prion, and what it's going to do is it's going to alter or change the shape of that protein, and it's going to become the new prion. And as we had said, as it continues in this cycle, it's going to aggregate these prions. And when they begin to aggregate, of course, that's when you're going to get the outcome of the disease for that prion. All right, so that's going to finish up our one and only screencast for Chapter 19. And as always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide.